Okay, welcome to another episode of the Conundrum Podcast. Um, it's been a few minutes since the last episode. Um, just some quick housekeeping. Um, just had a lot of uh, stuff going on, a lot of different projects in the works. Um, so I had to give some extra time to that in order to get it fully running. Um, the uh, Quarter Notes podcast that I do with Rich Knox um, for Lost Cowboys Drumsticks. Um, so we've got a few episodes under our belt now and we're kind of finding a rhythm there. So I'm able to kind of divert back into doing uh, these episodes with the conundrum on my own platform. Um, so yeah, the last episode we did with uh, Danko Jones, um, who Rich plays drums for, um, was a fantastic episode and I uh, look forward to keeping that going. Like I said, I ventured out into other provinces, uh, other uh, from other artists from other areas of Canada. Um, so that'll definitely be uh, an option moving forward. Um but for right now, uh, we're going to come back to Atlantic Canada um, for a little bit with some guests. Um, the first one being this episode is Kylie Fox. Uh, she's based out of Fredericton, uh, originally from St. John. Uh, she's a quote unquote folk singer. Uh, we get into the whole folk category, genre, whatever, um, in the podcast. Um, we talk about, you know, women in music and art um, and the whole patriarchy of you know, just some areas that, that need improving in the industry. Um, and there have been steps in the right direction. Um, but of course there's always, we can always do better. Um, so we kind of get into that a little bit. Um, we don't go too dark, <laughs> we don't go too deep. Um, but it, it is worth noting. Um, we also talk about, um, her new single that just came out confetti, um, which will, also ties into uh, her new album that is being worked on called, that's going to be called Sequoia. Um, I think I pronounced that right. Um, so anyway, it's a fantastic chat. Um, Kylie is a very personable, very genuine person. And I really think it comes through in the conversation that we have today. Um, so I don't want to give too much away. I don't want to keep talking here. Um, so I'm just going to cut into the episode um, so it was a pleasure speaking with Kylie and I hope you all enjoy my conversation with Kylie Fox. The lovely computerized voice told me that we're in business. <laughs> How are you? I'm awesome. I'm doing really well. Well, that's I'm good. Yeah, it's a beautiful day. I had coffee on my front porch. We have like a little step and it like the sun hits it first thing. Oh, that's nice. Um, so it's, it's been like it was warm enough to just sit out there and have coffee today. Which is the nice. weather's changing. Yeah, actually, that's like one of the first things I wanted to do was congratulate you on the house. Like, how, how's it been being a homeowner now? It's been awesome. We love it. We love this house more and more every day. Um, it was a little bit scary buying the house. Uh, well, for many reasons. But one of the reasons was the fact that um, uh, Ryan uh, works daytime. So I was the one who was driving around with his dad looking at houses. And when we saw this, um, it was the first one that wasn't like a real piece of garbage <laughs> and I could see some potential here. And I was, it was yeah. just kind of like the situation was getting tired, but we had this feeling about the house. So without Ryan or his, or anyone else seeing it, me and his dad decided that this was the one. And, and took so on, Ryan took it on blind faith. Yeah. So the day, <laughs> the day we closed was the first day that he saw it. And of course, like our room, um, was painted mustard yellow and the walls are that stucco texture mm -hmm. um and that's what the first thing well one of the first things his mom said was didn't you see the walls <laughs> but yeah, we painted it white and now it's kind of it's kind of vibey and walls um, are irrelevant yeah. uh they can't they can be irrelevant mustard colored stucco walls I wouldn't say are irrelevant I think that would bother me um yeah but, but this, I mean like from when... here when it comes to buying a house, like the, the, all you need is the space. Like if you can, and you as an artistic person, you can see potential in, you know, that mustard stucco wall and be like, well, that's not going to be what that is. You can see what it's going to be after the fact. Like, so that, that's what I mean by that. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so. It was well taken care of. And, and um, you know, we've been at, we've been at six months now. Um, and things weren't on the walls and the TV was mounted and the mm -hmm. kitchen was half painted. And um, Brian recently got his tonsils taken out and all of those things are, are complete now. <laughs> yeah. one good thing. Just because oh, he can't talk doesn't mean he can't do something else. <laughs> well, he was just uh, home and bored for, oh gosh, getting your tonsils taken out as an adult is the worst. I'm, I've still got mine and I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, hold it's, on to them. Yeah, I'm going to just keep them, keep them close to the chest or the yeah. throat or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, big congratulations on the release of your new song, Confetti. It's a banger. I love it. Thank you. I love yeah. it too. Yeah. Um, and from what I understand, this is like just a teaser of what's going to be on the next album. Well, the next album, I guess the whole album is going to be um, produced by Daniel Ledwell. So this this song will be on the album. The, the album's in the making. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of artists are doing this. We're just going to like drop a bunch of singles when they're ready. Mm -hmm. And I, I could probably say the album would be out in spring 2024 um, if everything goes to plan. Mm -hmm. You have to like, uh, give these things time and space. Yeah, they, they need the time. They need the time, especially with, with your style of songwriting. And we're going to get into that, like where a lot of it does seem very personal. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the new album. I, I love the, the first one, Green, which is great. But we're going to get into that. I want to let's Tarantino this a little bit and go back to your origin story. Okay, great. All right. So, um, so you're from St. John, if I understand. Yes. Okay. Um, how was it growing up there? Because, like, I know my wife is from there, and we spent a few years when we were first together, up until we moved here after we had our son. Um, so, what side of the city did you did you come up in? I'm a proud West Sider. Okay. Um, I had an awesome childhood. Uh, there was a ton of kids in the neighborhood, and I was the closest house to school, so they would all arrive at my house at like eight in the morning and then we'd all like walk to school together every day and walk home together every day. It was just like a, a great neighborhood to wander around in. And mm -hmm. um, I, I felt like a, like part of the place my dad um, has never left that side of town. And it was just like um, the community there is awesome. Mm -hmm. And I, I love, I love visiting home. I, I do think, um, you know, I was ready to leave after high school and not living there makes me appreciate it much more. Mm. It's, it is my favorite place. I, I do, I remember the first time I flew home, uh, I went to my first university in Montreal and the first time I stepped off the plane and like really noticed the salt and the thickness of the air and how much I, I missed that and mm -hmm. how much you don't notice it when you're, when you're living there and having the ocean on your peripherals all the time. Um, it's, a, it's a gift and when you grow up with it, um, I think you need it. So I love Fredericton. Mm -hmm. um, this community here has, has absolutely blanketed me with so much love and support and, and fun. And I found like a whole family here. Um, the, the art scene is just amazing. Um, but I, I love going back to St. John. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we don't often get back and it's weird. Like you said, like you miss it. Like there's certain things like even now, like just the other day we went to a farmer's market and, uh, here in town and we're like man i miss that uptown market <laughs> you know like there's yeah. just so many things you take for granted that being one of the many yeah mm, it's beautiful and every time i go there's new uh, there's new cool spots to check out i just played that wasted day on friday night and like that's a great spot right on water street now mm -hmm. um yeah it's cool it's a cool vibe yeah it, it it's changed a lot i know since since the last time we were we were there it's man i don't i can't even it, it was well before covid that we were able to go so we haven't been back since that whole blip in the timeline um, <laughs> i blacked it out i don't know who you probably did too. <laughs> yeah a lot of us did um, yeah yeah so obviously you enjoy growing up in saint john um as if your family is 
do you come from a musical background? Like, is there other other musicians or singers, songwriters, just guitar players in your family? Um, my dad was the youngest of nine, and there was a like piano prodigy in the family, and everyone could play guitar, and if they couldn't play, they could croon. All brothers, and yeah. um, so his you know family culture was growing up poor with a ton of people around, having kitchen parties surrounding their mom on the piano. Um, and, you know, as I grew up, that's what our Fox family parties looked like. Um, lots of moose light involved, of course. Um, and dad, w dad was the center of the party. Um, he was like the leader of the songs and would take mm -hmm. requests and have his big list of songs against like, like literally laminated to the guitar <laughs> so he could remember what songs he could yeah. do. I don't think he knew how to finish any song. He would just start them until he forgot the words and then I'd continue on. But, so I, I, I grew up, um, you know, really idolizing my dad for that. I thought that was so cool. Um, and of course he loved Joni Mitchell and gave me the best Joni Mitchell education. Like driving to school, he would like recite her lyric before she would sing it and then explain to me like, why this was a great lyric. Okay. Um, so which set the standard for like how I listened uh, and wrote um, poetry. And, uh, you know, I do say in my bio that like I sound like Joni Mitchell, but that's like such a <laughs> big statement. I, I, will, uh, I will aspire and keep trying to hit that mark, but um, she does remain to be the, the, the standard. Or She's the, bar. the benchmark. Yeah, yeah. She's the benchmark. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, but there are similarities there though. I mean, you're, you're not wrong. There are similarities. Well, I think a lot of artists start sounding like who they, who they listen to, like, mm -hmm. and even with my voice, I don't know. I, I don't know the science behind how you develop a voice. Like I know, I know the anatomy of singing. I, I studied classical singing in university, but when it comes to like how, how you perform, like, is it just the patterns of what you've heard growing up? Like, I know i I, uh, I listen to Brandy Carlisle like every day in high school and I just like the folk I think it starts infusing in your vocal cords like that's how you sing you sing like mm -hmm. what you hear yeah yeah well, and that's that's with the same with any instrument I mean people could say I rip off tons of drummers just from how I play whether it's how I play physically or the actual notes that I'm playing or you know that's just it all comes from your influence and and you like you say you grow up you emulate your heroes or you you know that you learn that so you learn that as part of your craft and then it becomes part of your vocabulary and then your interpretation comes out so and yeah. then someone else is going to hear how you do it and then that'll influence them and then it'll influence the next generation and it's it's all cyclical it, it, it that's one feeds the next feeds the next and that's how we keep music and art alive yeah it's pretty cool yeah it, it's it's awesome and and growing up i didn't see it that way because you know just a punk kid and you know right. just want to be noise. A, yeah you know you want to be original yeah. i guess like you yeah. want to be like this is all this is all coming from my heart on the first but no that's yeah, everything no. uh yeah that's everything yeah and yeah and then you look at your heroes or the people that you emulated and you dive into their background where they got it from and it came from somebody else and you go down that rabbit hole and you know, it's, it's why I love music and, and, and the community of musicians so much just because of everyone that has their influence and their voice where it came from and, and how they put it out into the world and how they are in turn, like I said, going to influence the next group of people. Speaking of, I saw a post, um, this might be a little sidetrack, but I saw a post on, I think it was your Instagram, uh, you're in front of a bunch of students, like are you working with schools and, and or, or teaching in any way? Yeah, I'm currently music directing for the TNB Theater School. Okay, that's what So I mean. the high school kids are doing a new musical called Rose, written by Mike Ross on, from BEI, which is super cool. It was a bit stressful because it's like currently getting workshopped. So we're, we're getting new drafts of music. <laughs> and, um, I'm pulling my hair out a little bit, <laughs> but we're getting, we're getting through it. It's going, it's going to be at the playhouse in three weeks here in Fredericton. And then the, the junior kids are doing Annie. Nice. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. So yeah, and that's what I do. And you've got your hands in, in Annie as well, like in that yeah. production. Yeah. That's awesome. So that that's your your day gig is is musical director for the theater. Well, yeah, I do that Monday, uh, Monday and Tuesday evenings, um, and then on Wednesdays, I've been I've taken on this incredible project um, called the Spirit Project. It's a collaboration with uh, Larsh. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Larsh, Larsh is a, an international um, support organization for adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, and they've partnered with uh, Solo Chicken Theater Company here in Fredericton. So we've created this amazing thing called the Spirit Project where we get in the room together and create art and create songs. And, um, and we're putting on uh, their, their second production. They've, they've put on a show before I was working with them. And they toured it throughout Atlanta, Canada. And so I've been brought in to write all the music for this upcoming show um, that's taking place uh, in May and June. Like from the ground up, you mean? Like. There's, yeah, no, it, there's no music currently like you're you're creating all original music yeah yeah wow. and all all through the like i've been recording our sessions and i just been taking like verbatim the things that we we say in our meditations and our affirmations and and turn it use those as my lyrics and um, i'm really happy with what i've come but i sort of knew going into the project that there was um like working this way i was going to channel something awesome to serve, mm. to serve this. Um, yeah, it's all very folk, all super funny and silly and fun. Yeah. Is that something that you'd want to release like as like a, a maybe like a side project or, or like a B-side to, to your solo stuff? Uh, I think it will get released. Um, yeah. I've already, I've already recorded it all for it to be used in the show. So I think it will be released as like the spirit project and Kylie Fox or something. Mm -hmm. I'd love That's to really share cool. those songs. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if, like you say, they're impactful and affir like affirming, with, you know, those affirmations and stuff that, you know, a lot of people need to hear that kind of stuff. I know it's very personal, especially for the people that are coming up with the affirmations, because like I know with meditation and stuff like, you know, your affirmation is your own. And a lot of people don't share what that is, you know, especially, you know, dealing with mental health or anxiety, like that's something that you hold on to because it's your safe place. Um, so not a lot of people would share that um have you had any issues with with putting those in your lyrics because of that or it's all just one big safe place and everybody feels okay with that yeah everything that's being shared is being shared you know with, with consent and, and with love and um and with it's fun to share something of your own identity because it uh it reminds you who you are and, and when you can share with other people who reflect it back to you. Um, so one of our meditations that we do is we uh, imagine what our heart looks like in our hands, whether it's, you know, glittery, whether it's a, whether it's a strawberry or like what, what could be a handful of jelly beans. And then we imagine all the hearts floating up into the circle all together. Um, and you try to imagine everyone else's heart. And with them, we go around the circle and then we say what our heart is that day. And so, you know, some people could say, my heart is feeling heavy or my heart is gooey. Um, so one song is just, it, it's all about how uh, all the different ways your heart can feel, how your heart can be everything. All at once. I'm looking forward to hearing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that, that sounds like, yeah. That's a very interesting project and yeah that's that's a, that's really cool it's not um it's a very privileged place to be in order to be able to 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 hear that and, and share that yeah yeah because they're, tr uh, yeah. they're trusting so, you with that yeah mm -hmm. um and it's and it's nice too just to to work that way work differently than how i would go about writing my own songs mm, that's true too yeah in a more collaborative, open way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, I know you did some collaborations recently um, that were put out, like, um, why am I blanking on the name of this? You know, the skateboard song. <laughs> yeah, uh, Nikki Gallant and I wrote two songs yeah. together in 2021 through the Canadian Song Challenge. 
and those were those were also produced by Daniel Ludwell. That's how that's how I I even come to came to know him. Mm -hmm. Um, I love yeah, collaboration is awesome. I love it. You get to just like leave all of your old habits at the door and and learn someone else's and there's no uh, no expectation for like does this sound like a Kelly Fox song I actually never write I never write thinking like does this sound like a Kelly Fox song the <laughs> album <laughs> the album that is about to come out there's like three songs that are really like jazz infused uh two that are kind of more rock some are folk, like it's it's a it's a whole bag Artists aren't really holding on to genres anymore. It's not cool to talk about genre. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And, and well, I mean, a lot of artists that you expect them to come out with a rock album, come out with, you know, like a more dance or a pop or, you know, I mean, like the Foo Fighters were working with, um, uh, what's his name, Cruzen that did worked on Adele stuff. Like, you know, they're known for being a rock band and now they're working with a top 40 pop producer and, you know, it's just one example of, of you know, breaking those walls between bear, uh, genres. You know, music is music. It's either good to you or it's good to someone else. There's nothing. I don't like saying that there's bad music because somebody's going to like something. It's all based mm -hmm. on taste. It's all personal taste and preference. And, you know, the whole guilty pleasure thing. It's either you like it or you don't. And there's no shame in that, you know. And yeah, like, like a lot of things, a lot of walls are being torn down. A lot of stigmas are, are going by the wayside. You know, the patriarchy is falling. These are all great things. <laughs> yeah. That patriarchy better be falling. Yeah. <laughs> it's falling pretty slow. <laughs> um, and I mean, in, in New Brunswick, uh, you know, and I've been seeing it and I've seen it for a long time. There's a lot of amazing, talented women that are finally getting some spotlight, you know, um, as a female artist yourself, do you find that there's been a shift like as far as the industry and like the representation for women? Um, I do notice I listen, I listen mostly to female, um, artists. Uh, I, th I think it's just like, um, the storytelling, the voices and it's relatable. Um, that's what I gravitate to most. Um, my experience, I think the biggest change that I felt, um, well, I, I think there's more conversation now about like almost needing to fill the spots. I don't know if you follow the Instagram account where it shows the, uh, like festival posters with, um, all the names blotted out that don't have a female in the project. And sometimes it's just like the posters left pretty bare it's, yeah it's pretty and, empty festival um so it's just a conversation that's uh being talked about and more festivals uh, i think are no better now um i know that there's a couple events here in town that got boycotted because there just wasn't enough representation um like events um mm -hmm. i think the biggest thing i've seen change since i've been playing music is uh is the social media aspect um when i put out my first project in 2017 um i like barely had instagram um and like instagram live wasn't a thing i didn't have spotify yet spotify was like on the ups and yeah social media and streaming has like drastically changed how uh artists are being discovered and shared and mm -hmm. how artists can like market themselves for free. Um, and I feel like artists now are more equipped um, with uh, knowing where there are producers and how to connect and network with people. Um, but when I, 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 from, I really thought that like there was only one or two producers or audio engineers, like, in the area. I didn't realize that there's, that there had been so many. Um, I mean, maybe I'm saying this now because now, uh, now I know maybe that's mm -hmm. the difference. <laughs> Hindsight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as social media and 
and like when we're talking with the voices that people have a lot uh, there's a lot more accountability um i think with with social media being so relevant uh, what's the word i'm looking for you know social media being so out there so in your face where everybody has access you know you've got to really mind your p's and q's you know with what you're putting out there you know as far as i mean that whole cancel culture and all that but like in the me too movement and and you know these are things that that needed to be said and it was really the social media that that brought that to the forefront in order to make the positive change and the voices being in the artists you know being able to express themselves freely that way you know and, and make a stand to make changes you know has completely influenced the way that the industry works now yeah i, I think there there's much more accountability and responsibility to you know think about how you're saying things and think about when and when you can take a space and when you let someone else mm -hmm. um, have, <laughs> be seen um and i i think it's also knowing your own boundaries with social media as well um, because it is a game and it is a lot and it just takes a toll on people's mental health uh, I think very evidently um, yeah. you know it, very easily you can go on and see how many other people are spending their weekend and how many other people are getting gigs that you haven't gotten <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and yeah. I think just knowing your boundaries of, of when and how you consume uh, social media and, and whether you even could scroll, I, uh, um, like engaging on the platform, uh, as an artist is something that I, you know, I go on to support and to self-promote and, um, you know, see what's relevant, but I, I, tr I really try to keep my phone down. <laughs> It's really um, and, hard and stay focused. Yeah. And I mean, and being as, you know, where everybody manages their own social media for the most part, I mean, at least in the independent scenes, like, you know, you don't necessarily have a publicist that's, that's, you know, putting your social media, or handling your, all of your, you know, handles and Twitter and all that stuff, you know, as being a, an artist that has to manage, you know, creating the art and then, putting the the visual aspect of it and then creating content to go on the TikTok and the Instagram and stuff. That's a full-time gig that you, not everybody is equipped to do because like you said, it does take a toll mentally, you know, the anxieties and the, the jealousy of, you know, why didn't I get that gig or why are they busier than I am? And, you know, I put this post out there and it's clearly a better post it's well, it's, you know, better put together than theirs, but they have, you know, a hundred thousand clicks or whatever. And I've got like 20, like it's really hard. And that I don't, I don't think it's fair to artists to have to do that. Um, that's the one negative from, from the social media is, is, you know, that it's a lot of work and it's, you know, not everybody has that time to be able to do that. Yeah. And just the consistency of, um not attitude but like well-being like there, there's some days I just don't have the energy or my spirit's a little dim and I just don't I don't feel like putting myself out there that way in in ways that I think artists you know you, you do have to there's upkeep uh it's like it's like a very public bedroom where you can live in a bedroom I'm thinking about like having a messy room mm -hmm. I just I did I just updated my website and I was like oh my gosh people are looking at this um <laughs> um yeah but uh and then on days I'm feeling great I you know I can thrive on social media there's part the social media has uh created great community it's the east coast music scene I feel like I I meet artists um that I felt I've already known just because I've been following them and and um yeah I, I've created lots of relationships meaningful relationships uh mm -hmm. with artists from all over um just through social media which is great it's it's awesome for networking that way yeah I mean that's I mean that's kind of partly how and why I started this whole podcast thing to begin with like mm -hmm. You know, when COVID hit, there was no, there was no gigs. There's nobody able to get out and meet. So 
you know, you hit up the social media and you, you, you know, you start talking to people and put it on video, <laughs> you know, have, have real conversations and, and get to know people. And, you know, hopefully anybody that does, you know, watch or listen to, to any of the content that I'm putting out there, hopefully that, you know, they kind of know who I am, but they know who more importantly, the people that I'm, that I'm bringing on and talking with, because that's the real goal is to, to put a spotlight on the people in our community. Um, because I've said it countless times, New Brunswick and Atlantic Canada punch way above our weight per capita when it comes to the talent and the arts that we have that come out of here versus the rest of the country. Full stop. <laughs> 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 Mic drop, whatever you want. It. Yeah. Um, but it's true. And, and I mean, and you, you, play festivals you've you've played with some some bigger names you know from from around all over and you're right up there with them you know thank you we're small but mighty yeah you know and i'm trying to get out of here <laughs> like um what i'm what i mean is like i guess try, i'm trying to get on festivals mm -hmm. um outside of atlanta canada that's what i'm saying yeah. so if you know anyone <laughs> <laughs> I, I maybe i don't know i, I don't know anyone because <laughs> to touring is one thing and it's there's beauty to touring and you you can meet lots of artists that way but yeah. playing a festival is just you don't have to do any work you just show up play a great set get to meet all the artists there there's already people there mm -hmm. you're on a nice poster yeah Festival's and the rock. people the people that are there are not necessarily there not necessarily there to see you but by being on that stage, they do get exposed to your music and then you build a fan base. I mean, that's, you know, that's putting in the miles, that's putting in the work, you know, as they say, paying your dues, you know, you, you work your way up the festival line or, you know, that's. Yeah. Your name gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. Or in my case, <laughs> smaller and smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so you mentioned you're a classically trained singer. Um so you studied voice, right? Um, how is how do you find that that's affected your songwriting, like in in writing to your voice? Interesting question. I don't I don't know if I write to my voice. I think I make my voice work to what I write. But maybe that's um, maybe that's not even fair to say. Um, I know. I know that uh, sometimes I write songs that are harder for me to perform on guitar to kind of get me, get my fingers moving. Um, it was like drills. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was recording Green, um, j -Vo came up to me and he's like, you know, next time you should really learn the songs before you come in and record them. <laughs> I thought he was just kind of flying off the seat of my pants. Like, here, here are all the songs I want to record. Uh, yeah, I'm still, like, learning how to play this one. Um, and I think sometimes that goes for singing, too. Like, the kind of the end part of Confetti or the climax where I'm belting out a little bit more. That sing performing that now is so much stronger than when I was performing it a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, my voice is, like, built up to be able to do that. Um, and I think my classical training has helped me just know in my body how to support that type of performance. Um, and yeah, sometimes, sometimes I really like to show off like my nice bright vibrato. And, um, sometimes I can't help it just because that's my voice. And, and sometimes I, I want to seem cooler and do what's like more of a trendy vocal performance, like what you hear girls on the radio sound like which I don't think I do, um, but it's all a mix. Mm -hmm. Because you, you do have a very unique style of, of vibrato. Um, the first time I heard your music, I it kind of, I kind of did a double take. I was like, wait, that's what's coming out? And it was like it was very refreshing because nobody else does that like that. And, and, I, and I mean that in a very positive way, obviously. Um, and, and in combination to the, the lyrics, 
um, and I guess we can get into the actual process of your lyrics um, as a as a quote unquote folk um, artist. Like if we're going to talk a genre, <laughs> um, <laughs> if we go back to those days of of genres, um, but it's very storytelling and very um, personal um, situations or, or life lived, you know. Um, so the the marrying of the two of those is it creates a very unique vibe. I can, yeah, I could say it's a vibe. Your album green was a total vibe from start to finish um where do you get because i mean clearly there's like you know you talk and you've talked about it on social media um, when you were doing the lead up to the release of green you know where you're breaking down each song um you know with kind of the ideas and, and you know where they came from and they're very personal um and that was great social media content right there you know because Thank it you. was it was a connection you know i felt like i was getting to know you as i was listening to the songs you know as they were coming out um so your style of songwriting is very much rooted in life lived and personal experience um or others that you know that of your what you see you know what you witnessed um you know with your um, your friends that the, the, the song cold feet <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> you know and it's i just think that it's not easy to write in that way um where it is so personal how how do you approach that like get over that in order to be able to to share those stories that was a really long-winded question but anyway keep going <laughs> I I think I think maybe because of Joni Mitchell growing up and hearing how personal those songs were, that's kind of how I thought I was supposed to write or how I wanted to write. I never um I never felt like I was giving too much away. Um I remember Terry Parker from Atlantic, I just spilled my coffee. Um Atlantic Access. Uh is that what it is? Yeah. Um he interviewed me after um, I did Balcony EP, my first EP. Um, and he said, "All of your, all of your music is so, so personal." Like, and I didn't really feel like it was. Of course, it, it was. It was very. I was so infused in the work. So I set off to write something that would actually make me very uncomfortable. So I came up with "Horny and Bored," which is on green. Um, and I guess that that <laughs> song could make me blush. Um, but I kind of like it. Like, I think I'm challenging the audience to just stay with me on that one. Um, the songs on, uh, on Sequoia are, I guess, me processing being in a, like a really long-term serious loving relationship. Uh, a lot of the songs are about Brian. Um, but I've also got, uh, one of the songs I'm like, excited about this kind of one of the harder songs for to, to perform it's called armadillo um and it's it's kind of about how the patriarchy <laughs> is not falling fast <laughs> not fast enough um all about you know women's skin and, and how we can protect ourselves and how it's also cyclical um you know just how one voice affects the next voice over generations like mm -hmm. just how one woman's trauma can affect another woman's trauma can affect another woman's trauma and how mm -hmm. do we solve this problem so there's that song and and the title track sequoia kind of touches on um like neglect and taking things for granted and, and i start the song kind of with a climate activist lens um you know geared up forest fires happening um but the song ends with a Kind of the relationship lens and how sometimes um i don't appreciate what i have um as i should and i'm aware of it i think working through these songs has helped me learn uh how i how i love and um you know and what i can work on as a person and as i'm talking about it right now i guess i'm sort of realizing that um uh, and then some of the songs are just really, really fun. Um, I'm kind of in, in this project, um, 
through working with my band, I've become much more attuned to um, thoughtfulness and quality of um, everything beyond the lyrics and the voice. I think when I started, I, I, I just held the lyrics and my vocal performance as the most important part without looking at the whole picture. And now I'm so privileged to have a, a band of players that we can really think through, like, how do we want this to sound? How do we want to feel? How can we make this grow? How can we use dynamics to really make this pop? And, mm-hmm. um, and so for this album, some of the, <laughs> like, I've got, I've got a song called Hit, and the song is all about, you know, you know the slang um, that just doesn't hit the same. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so the song is a list of things that don't hit the same. So there's one verse that goes, a green banana, a coffee without cream, Christmas down in the Caribbean. Like it's just, it's just silly and it's fun and it's yeah. jazzy. And um, I, I still, you know, obviously great to, a great importance to my lyrics, but some lyrics I was writing, you know, in the studio being like, this will, this will work. This will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that lyric was, um, the, the one that I was stuck on, I ended up going, uh, um, she'll host a dinner party for us soon with charcuterie from the moon. And I came up with that in studio and I was like, I think this will be fine. And now I'm, now I'm singing it and I'm like, okay, I really like this line. And that's, that's a song about a friend who we lost to suicide. Um, and so I guess I do have some heavy hitter topics on this next record. Mm-hmm. And this is another song that's just so fun. It's a celebration of her life. Yeah. And I just thought of her up in heaven, having a charcuterie <laughs> made out of the moon. <laughs> nice. Uh, you know, if you can, why wouldn't you though? I mean, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds that sounds delightful um the uh you mentioned your band um talk about a who's who in fredericton music community i mean how did you how were you able to to wrangle what i would call the avengers of new brunswick musical yes! talent <laughs> I'm gonna do that. Mm, just my charm right <laughs> <laughs> So they came to you. You just you just yelled yes. out assemble yes. and they showed up. <laughs> no, I was just lucky. You just never know. It was a shot in the dark. Like mm-hmm. uh apart from Ryan. Um, Ryan advised me on and I, I had of course I had known everyone, but not not very well. Mm-hmm. Um like and I, I really asked them initially just to play my single release concert, almost like a test drive. And man, did I ever luck out. Um, and I remember being so, I remember being so nervous our first practice. We were in Kelly Waterhouse's basement. For those listening, we are talking about Kelly Waterhouse, Camilo, Mia Mizar, Sean Hutchins, and, and Ryan Barrett. i to get uh, Kelly on here real soon. Yes. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I was talking to Kelly today. Oh my gosh. So yeah. lucky to have Kelly in my life. But at the time, uh, these people were, you know, acquaintances in the music scene. I didn't, I didn't know much about them mm-hmm. uh, besides their talent. And yeah, I was, I was really nervous to get <laughs> our first band practice in that basement. Uh, you know, being the leader, being, uh, you know, they've all got years and years on me for how long that they've, they've been playing, how, how many stages they've been on and projects they've played with. Um, and yeah, over time, we've just become a sweet little family. We've got an awesome dynamic. Um, it's been really great to to be on the road with them Mm -hmm. and that shows on the on the stage um i was lucky enough to to catch the tail end of your set at uh, broken records during the ecmas um last year which are coming up again soon um but just the the live performance really ups those songs from from that album from green um like you know, like because you've lived with the songs for so long and they, they kind of take a life of their own and then having the band um, kind of add their distinct little pieces to it you know be it they're playing the same part but just the energy is different or you know being on stage is way different than being in the studio because i know like ryan comes from you know a heavy rock background and you know he's not getting to 
to play those rock chops you know he's he really had to adapt his yeah. style of drumming you know? i got him playing brushes Dre. <laughs> brushes and mallets <laughs> and it's a good thing he works for los cabos because you know he, he's got a full stick bag now yeah <laughs> but it's hot <laughs> <laughs> well he is hot so there's that <laughs> but just the um the camaraderie and you know the the lightheartedness and the being able to take the piss out of each other that goes a long way on a live show like i for me personally you could fuck up a song the same song five times doesn't matter if you're having a good time and you're laughing about it and you know the the vibe is there who who gives a shit that's that's where i come from and i'm not saying you guys did that because clearly you didn't because the, the performances were flawless but i just mean in a way of you know that that group of people that you have um is really something special yeah i think what you're getting at is that we're just not taking it too seriously yeah. and i think that's um well that's you're taking the music seriously but not yourselves which is yeah yeah. I mean, we wear a different costume. We coordinate <laughs> outfits almost every show. Like we played the Winter Warmer Festival and Kelly knit, right? She knit five beards <laughs> and we all played in beards just so we could look like Jamie Steele who runs the festival. Um, they, that's, you know, I got them doing crazy yeah. things and they're all down to it. Sometimes I'll announce a show and the first question is, what are we wearing? <laughs> and normally it'll have to do with the festival, like shivering song. This year we all wore fur. Last year we wore snow pants and ski goggles. But yeah. I think that's what I, I want. I want um, the live show. I want the the, perform the performativity of the songs. I want the mm -hmm. um, the... The fun has to yeah. be part of the show. Yeah, because the the songs speak for themselves, right? So the show also has to bring itself. Which, yeah, I I, I can't wait to see you guys play again. Um, we're gonna have to figure that out. But anyway, that's another topic. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Sequoia. So that's not just a working title. That's the name of the next album. That's the name of the next album. Yeah, that, that's a lock. Um, so, and you've been working on. So, is that are these songs that you're kind of woodshedding and demoing? Is that what you're going to be recording? Because I know you were just um, you got that uh, Canada Council for the Arts grant. So, is that where that's going, or is that for another album? Like, is there a third one in the works? No, the Canada Council grant is is for this one. It's for okay. Sequoia, and all of the songs kind of umbrella theme of gratitude whether okay. it's there or not mm -hmm. um i think a, a lot that i mean that's a theme that can you can slap slap on a lot of songs but um i think we have a lot to be grateful for and um the, the album is going to be fun i i really want it to be an album you can people can put on as they like make brunch mm -hmm. um like a, a really sunny shimmery uh 12 12 songs okay 12 songs that's a lot of songs it's a and lot of not, songs they're not but like I've a, got a lot to say <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say 12 songs in, in my world that's like 20 minutes of music like <laughs> for, for for 12 songs for 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 you that's that's a solid 40 minute 45 minutes at least yeah I, yeah. yeah and i'm, I'm obsessed music. i'm obsessed with all of the songs and where they're going so <laughs> i can't wait i can't wait to release <laughs> the next one Awesome. Um, so I do have a recurring segment on the show you may be aware of. I call them the crash questions. Um, so they're kind of quick fire, but you know, if you want to elaborate, by all means. Um, but I always ask as a first question because it's the most personal, nearest and dearest to my heart. Um, and is it? Do you prefer cake or pie? Pie. Okay. Good. We can still be friends. Okay. <laughs> pie is just uh, anyway i'm not going to get into that because i don't pie want is not as, it's not as dense i guess True. um see and now i mean now you have me analyzing the question carrot cake is pretty good <laughs> there are some really good cakes you know um but you'd have to i'd i'd have to quantify cheesecake as being pie yeah okay well then yeah i'll lock in pie for shell 
<laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, now I don't want to, I don't want you to overanalyze this one. Um, okay. Cause I, but I know it could be like a parent choosing their favorite child, but what's your favorite beer brewed out of the Moosehead Brewery? Um, Moose Light. That's the green bottle, right? That's the that's that, blue. That would be Moose Green. Okay. Moose Light. I mean, Moose Light. That's the blue it's can. Okay. Blue can. Okay, so can or bottle? Bottle. Always. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right um so if you okay we were talking about like the whole touring and you know travel let's say you're traveling to a festival okay and you're driving your grandpa's lexus and there's Rest one cd and there's one cd stuck in the cd player yeah. which one do you not want it to be um there's a mixtape. No, I all of all of my CDs that were in my car and that I left there were like local artists. Um and I loved them all. Oh, what CD do I not want it to be? Oh, Blink 182. <laughs> <laughs> so you could give two shits that they've reunited. <laughs> I could give two shirts and I'm about to see them in Montreal. Oh my God. <laughs> so I'm like, Brian's taking me to that concert and I'm taking him to Joni Mitchell. <laughs> and we'll just, I mean, he's going to Joni Mitchell so he can watch me see Joni Mitchell. I'm going to Blink 182 okay. because I think Ryan just needed the date. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. I, uh, I feel like their concert experience is going to is gonna be like the right experience. I just, I don't yeah. like... Like them yelling at me in my house when I'm. But I wonder, like, because back in like when it was the original guys, I know they changed a bit when they had that other guy that came in for a while, Matt Skiba. But with the original, well, original lineup, um, their live show was a lot of like you know dick jokes and fart humor, and as guys that are like coming into their fifties, I wonder how that's gonna come off <laughs> you know i don't know i don't know if guys ever grow up i don't think i think age is irrelevant in the world of men yeah i'm not a man i'm a woman observing um but that's i'm sure that's gonna be all done to dick jokes and i'm just gonna roll my eyes all night <laughs> fair, fair <laughs> enough like, ryan go give me that moose light <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be do they have moose light in montreal probably you, not i don't know Definitely like, not. <laughs> they might have yeah. moose green if i'm lucky they yeah. definitely want to have Alpine. Alpine, yeah. Alpine is just a, a, a pigment of East Coast culture. Yeah. Yeah. We we keep that. That's ours. Um, uh, so if you had a time, I, I, I like the, all these hypothetical questions. Um, so if you had a time machine, okay, and you could go to any concert or event throughout history, which one would you want to experience in person? Go to Woodstock. The first one? <laughs> yes <laughs> not not the one with the, no. not 99 with limp biscuit <laughs> no. <all> the flyers. <laughs> so who would you want to see the most at that in that lineup of woodstock i think i would just want to feel woodstock okay i mean now that i'm thinking about the question i'd probably go see joni mitchell miles of isles tour or 180 i would go to newfoundland and watch my grandmother perform as eliza doolittle in my fair lady because my grandmother was a trained singer and she performed and i think that would be so cool wow well there's a side quest so you must get a lot of comparisons to your grandmother in in the whole like was she a renowned singer in her time no i think when i was a kid it would my perception of her was that she was a renowned singer okay. because the stories I heard was she she was Eliza Doolittle in this play when it was you know it was very likely community theater community theater rocks but it wasn't like a big league performance mm -hmm. well and, everything's so big when you're a kid right 
yeah and like her being on the radio and you know she would sing around to her dog and make up little songs just like my mom would make up little songs I didn't mention my mom when you asked about like has you know how has music been a part of your family my mom doesn't play instruments but my mom has a lot of music in her through my grandmother and I'm the queen of making up songs I think I sing a song to Ryan every morning as I like tap his head and send him off to work <laughs> Have a good day, sweetie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, you know, it would have been cool. Um, I've actually got a photo framed in my living room of my grandma, and she's in the middle of a, of a, an orchestra, and she's standing in a nice dress and and singing. Um, and I wish I knew more about about her history as a vocalist. Um, you know, she grew up to be a stay at home mom. And um, she passed away when I was in high school. And I guess now I'm grieving the questions that I never asked. She's from St. John, so I don't know. I don't know anyone who really heard her sing. Um, I think that once she had kids, she just kind of shut that down. Yeah, a lot of people do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which, I mean, raising kids is, you know, a noble and I mean, you know, it's one of the most rewarding and most difficult things to do. Um, and, and as an individual with a child myself, like you, especially in the early days, you know, when they're so young and they can't take care of themselves, like you give up so much of who you are as a person to, to provide for them. And a lot of people get stuck in that and then they can't find themselves on the other side of that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty heavy to think, to look back. Cause like, I know my father, like my, my whole family comes both sides, you know, um, musical background, you mentioned kitchen parties and stuff. And that was basically every weekend from when I was, oh boy, I want to say eight, seven years old until I was old enough to like not go anymore, you know, stay home. Um, but every weekend and it was guitars and fiddles and harmonicas and spoons and, you know, whoever wasn't playing was tapping on their lap and stomping their feet and everybody was singing along. It was probably the, you know, some of the best memories that I have looking back and just knowing like they all to me were like, like you said with your, you know, your grandmother, like you, you looked at them with such admiration and, and you know thinking that they're the best musicians in the world. And I think they could probably hold a candle to, to some, you know, they were phenomenal players. Um, but just looking back that, that that was their release because Monday to Friday, you know, they were roofers, they were electricians, they were carpenters, they were doing the, you know, the physical labor because, you know, that's what they did at that time to provide for their families. Um, so without that release, you know, during those weekends and they got smashed like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no yeah. like we there were often many times where we had to stay the night because there was no way we were driving home um, hmm. well yeah. it's interesting all right we bring that up we just had our first house party here um it was a single a single release party because my my concert got canceled so we had a, we had a house party instead it was our first house party ever it was a funeral for my lexus um, cause I had to ditch it outside of Halifax on my last tour in Soldier Parts, which just broke my heart. So I had a little mantle where I put the key and I did a little eulogy. Um, and it was a, it was a very belated birthday party for me too. Cause my birthday happened when Ryan had his tonsils out. Yeah. Um, and, and what the party was, uh, a jam and, you know, Hotch brought his, his son, who's like a month old, and he came to the party for about 40 minutes and everyone mm -hmm. gets a chance to hold him. And and it's just, it's nice to know that uh, this is available to us, you know, when we do have kids, mm -hmm. um, when, you know, when everyone in this community has kids, that it's just open house, uh, bring your guitars. And mm -hmm. um, it was like a really warm feeling of having everyone. Like I had a, a whole bin of shakers and, um, <laughs> And, and other percussion stuff too so there was like a lot of people involved it was sweet that's awesome and i th i think that's super important because like you know from an early age that's you know that's where a lot of 
musical influence can happen. It can shape who you are and the direction that you take as a person, you know, in your formative years. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope you guys keep that up and maybe one day I'll crash it. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> We've awesome. got enough drum kits to go around. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> um, well, this has been phenomenal. I can't thank you enough for for coming on and being on the podcast. Um, this has been a real treat. Yeah, my pleasure, Dre. I, I'm glad we could work out a special time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, so all the best with, you know, Confetti. It's, you know, hoping you get in all the streams and, and I really look forward to the new album. Um, and I'm going to have the links to all the socials in the description and all that stuff. And people can check out your your first full length green and your uh, is your ep i didn't see your ep is that on um like spotify's and all that uh it was up until recently i took it down on okay. on the five-year anniversary i i let that one go okay um i love the songs it just uh it wasn't showcasing what i do anymore and yeah from a marketing standpoint i just want to be sure that if someone's coming upon my page that they they get the best version 100 yeah. percent. yep and they do because, like I say, it's a phenomenal album and I hope everybody checks it out and goes and sees one of your live performances when you guys get back out on the uh, in the clubs. The old dusty road. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thank you, Dre. Take care. All right. So that does it for another episode of the Conundrum Podcast. I hope you all enjoyed it, um, however you listen or watch. Um, so hopefully these become... Um, well, the goal is to have these become bi-weekly again, like I said, uh, take a, some time to uh, to give the other projects some love. Um, so these should be back to a bi-weekly uh, release. Uh, I've got lots of other people that I want to talk to um, in and around Atlanta, Canada, and uh, some other people that I'll be reaching out to. Um, but in any event, um, for this episode, Kylie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was a fantastic chat. Um, if you are in the area that uh, she's performing do yourself a favor go and watch the show um the band like we said are amazing musicians um, they put on a fantastic show um uh, very very interactive very personable with the crowd uh, a lot of good banter um just a good time you know when you when you see that the band is enjoying themselves on stage it makes it that much more special um from the audience perspective um, so yeah, go check out Kylie Fox, go and support by following, liking, um, she's a great follow on Instagram and TikTok, lots of good content. Um, so yeah, that'll do it for this episode. Like I said, um, until the next one, take care of yourselves, take care of each other and we'll see you in the next. All right.